Well, we're um, going through the Song of Solomon, and we, we saw last week the introduction, which introduces these big themes that, that Christ is the lover of our souls. He is the bridegroom, that the church is the bride, and uh, well, we'll yeah, we are we are the beloved. Do you, do you believe that? Believe it, I find it very strange. It is strange, isn't it, to, to think I'm the wife. Uh, men, we have to work a bit harder on this one, guys. But we are the wife. And, and it, in fact, all through um, this Song of Solomon, though Solomon is the writer, it's the bride that does much of the talking, does most of the talking. Actually, you actually go through it. The bridegroom says much less than the bride. Well, uh, we saw last time that uh, it's the song of songs, the greatest song ever written, because it's the song of songs about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods. And it's about Christ's relationship with his church. And uh, a pale image of that is, is any marriage. And it doesn't matter how good our marriage is, we always think, it could be better. I, I could be a better husband. My wife could be a better wife. And that's because all marriage, no matter how good they are, are to point us to the fulfillment of the heavenly marriage. Christ as the bridegroom, the church as the bride. And so even in the best marriage, there's like, well, well there's something missing. There, there could be more here. And that's pointing us to the fulfillment of not in a physical marriage here, but there is an eternal spiritual marriage to come. And we saw that the name of Christ is like beautiful perfume or a fine aftershave. It's fragrant. Well, let's read. We're going to read from uh, chapter 1. Uh, and it's second part of verse this is the, the beloved, the woman, the bride uh, speaking. How right they are to adore you. Because the verse before, the friends of the bride said, we rejoice and delight in you. That's masculine singular. So it's talking about Christ, the husband. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. And here the, 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 the bride how right they are to adore you. We can understand why people would love Jesus. Because he's altogether lovely. There's nothing bad in him. He's the righteous one. He's holy and pure and undefiled and, and caring and, and sacrificial and, and altogether lovely. But what about me and you? There's, um, when I was playing rugby for Mosley, uh, one of the players was Nick Jevons. And uh, he was, uh, he'd been England captain. He was flanker for England. Uh, this is going back a long time, some of the younger ones. Remember Superstars? Mm. Yeah. And Brian Jacks won Superstars in this country and then went to, to do the international Superstars. Brian Jacks was the judo chief. But he, he got injured. The runner-up, was Nick Jevons and so Nick Jevons actually went to take Brian Jack's place in the international superstars Nick Jevons was an Adonis he had this perfectly chiseled body he was about six foot three England international and you stood next to him in the changing rooms in your underpants or we went we played in an international rugby tournament in the Bahamas I walked next to Nick Jevons on a beach in the Bahamas. I felt like Noddy next to a Greek god. He was like this torso like this, six foot three, muscles on his muscles, fantastically good looking. And then there was me. And I thought, oh, any ego I had about my looks just shriveled into a raisin. 
we can we can have very high ideas about ourselves, but when we place ourselves up against Jesus, any idea we, we had about how beautiful we were, how good we were, how righteous we are, just shrivels compared to Jesus. And, and here's the, the, the bride, and, and she says, how right they are to adore you. Because she's thinking of her beloved. But then she says, dark am I yet lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the dark like the tents, curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and they made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I neglected. In other words, this is why I'm dark. I had to work outside in the vineyards in the Palestinian sun. Now, we have to work hard to understand what she's saying here. Because in, in our society, society, everyone wants a good tan. People want to be dark. Dark is the side of, hey, you're rich enough to go for a winter sun holiday and a summer sun holiday abroad. You don't get dark going on holiday in Wales. Well, unless you want to get rain dark, darkened. It doesn't tend to happen, does it? Now, but you, you, you go anywhere from Turkey east and people don't want to be dark. Because if you are dark, if you're tanned, it's because you're poor and you have to work outside. So you don't want to look dark. And even if you're poor, you will buy your L'Oreal Fair and Lovely Skin Lightening Cream. And you will put it on overnight. In India, it's very hard to find any moisturizer, even men's, that hasn't got bleach in it. Or some sort of bleaching product. Because it's the idea of if you are light-skinned, you're pale and interesting. You are rich. So you stay indoors and you let your servants go outside and look after your garden and, and uh, uh, go and do your shopping uh, in the bazaars outside. See, it's rich people who stay inside. And, and here is, is this bride, but she's dark. And people stare at her because she's Dark. And this has got an awful lot to say to you and me. What do you think makes you beautiful? Well, is it, is it what society says that makes you beautiful or makes you ugly? If you... If you Listen to what society says about beauty or ugliness or, or, or you think what they're saying about you. It just leads to great insecurity, anxiety, possibly even depression. And actually, we, we live in a society where there are more antidepressants being prescribed that, than at any other time in history. There are millions and millions of prescriptions for antidepressants every year. And it's not just to do with our weather. Remember this song? See if you can spot the lyrics. Tonight you're mine completely. You give your love so sweetly. Tonight the light of love is in your eyes. But will you still love me tomorrow? Is this a lasting treasure or just a moment's pleasure? Can I believe the magic of your sighs? Will you still love me tomorrow? Tonight with words unspoken you say that I'm the only one. But will my heart be broken when the night meets the morning sun? I'd like to know that your love is love I can be sure of. So tell me now, and I won't ask again, will you still love me 
tomorrow. Actually, for most of us, I think a more appropriate song is, Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? <laughs> when I'm 64. <laughs> Not long ago. <laughs> but, but the words of those lyrics, and, and even that Beatles one, you know, getting older, we still want people to love us, when, even when we're old, don't we? And, and, you know, well, the looks are going, aren't they? Let's be honest. Yeah. If we ever had any to start off with, the looks are going. Um, I, I remember one of uh, one of the old comedians saying, "You know, you're getting old when you stand up out of your seat and your bottom's still in it. <laughs> Everything's sta- sagging. Gravity is winning. You know, you don't just need makeup to fill those little laughter lines. You need polyfiller. You're losing your hair. You're losing its colour. You've got to wear glasses." You don't so much smell of nice aftershave anymore as much as deep heat. (laughs) We're desperate to be loved, but if beauty is only skin deep, if beauty is what society says is beautiful, there's only ever going to be insecurity. Or if we think that We've got to do things in order to make God love us. There can only ever be insecurity. Because whatever you do could never be good enough. Because God's holy. He's pure. And whatever you do, even the best that you do, even the best that I do, is, is tainted, it's tarnished, it's, it's polluted by selfishness, by, by impure motives, and by, well, we just don't do it well enough. And we live in an age of oh, the selfie. Um, John Rankin is, uh, is a London photographer, and, and he just recently did an exhibition called Selfie Harm. Uh, he took, uh, took a load of photos of, of teenagers, of six forms, six formers, and then he gave them the digital image on a tablet and said, right, here's the software. You, you are free to change this photo of yourself however you want, but when you give it back to me, I want it to be ready to go on Instagram. And he called this exhibition Selfie Harm. He said, they mimicked their idols' poses you know where they suck the cheeks in and stick their lips out, the trout pout. They mimicked their idols' poses. They made their eyes bigger. They made their noses smaller. They made their skin lighter, all to get more likes on social media. He says, it's a reason why we're living in what sociologists call FOMO culture. Do you know what FOMO, F-O-M-O, do you know what it stands for? Fear of missing out. And psychologists say FOMO culture, fear of missing out, leads to sadness, sickness, increased anxiety, and Snapshot dysmorphia. I had to look that one up. (laughs) Snapshot dysmorphia. In other words, the image you portray on social media has nothing to do with what you really look like. And then there's a fear of what will people say when they realise. There's a fake me and a real me. And But that's nothing new. We all do it, don't we? We might not do it on Snapchat or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, but we we all have a public persona and a private persona. You might think I'm nice. You should be in my house sometimes and listen to the way I speak to my wife. Especially when I've got a bad back and I'm a bit snappy. I wouldn't dare do it if there was other people around. That doesn't fit with my public persona. But my real persona, there's always what will people think 
if they find out what I am really like. If they only knew. Uh, Alexandra Jones is a BBC reporter, and, uh, and she joined in uh, one of these self-beautifying uh, experiments uh, on the internet uh, for an article. The article is titled, I Tried an Instagram Face. She said, I did it for a week, and this is what happened. Um, and she wrote her article, The Rise of Selfie Makeup and the Quest for Hyper-Perfection. She said, even those who aren't plugged into beauty trends will have seen the rise of the selfie baddie. Someone who's taken a selfie of them, and they're all in nice clothes, and, and you actually look at it and you go, that is awful. Couldn't they see? She said, the look pioneered by stars like Kim Kardashian, full of lips, Cupy doll's eyes, these great big doll's eyes, great big long lashes, full of lips. Uh, one of Hannah's friends does lip fillers. And she actually um, messaged Hannah, my daughter, to say, um, can I take photos of your face and your lips to put them on my advertising Facebook page? And Hannah went, no, because these are natural. You're not using them to say, this is what my lip fillers look like. But it's this look, full of lips, these cupid doll's eyes, great big long lashes, high aristocratic cheekbones, sucked in cheeks, slim nose. Uh, Ariana Grande, she's another one who, who's, all the photos are, are like this helped to create a new beauty ideal that experts say is impossible to come by naturally. She says, the next day I feel bouncy from the reaction. My new face has got onto Instagram and it's got over a hundred likes. Some of them are full of fire emojis. Girl, you're on fire. I've got over 20 people saying, girl, you look amazing. I've got new followers all from one picture. It's addictive. But it's not real. More and more men and women have got bulimia and anorexia because of the image that is being pushed. If you're a bloke, you've got to have a chiselled six-pack. If you're a woman, you've got to be a size zero with big sticking out bums so you get your Brazilian bum, bum lifts. Um, I was actually listening to a programme uh, a couple of weeks ago on Radio 4 was saying actually the trend is starting to reverse now and, and some of these social media influencers who've gone for the big lips and the puffy out cheeks and the uh, are now saying, oh, no, no, it's the natural look we need to go for now. And they're now having to pay to have all these fillers dissolved and taken out. And then there are all these horror stories of, of if the fillers were bad quality, when the, or the, the, the chemicals they put in to dissolve them isn't, isn't good quality, then they end up all lumpy and bumpy and, and having to pay thousands and thousands of pounds for, for plastic surgery. That's the society we live in. It's all about what you look like on the outside in order for people to like you, in order for people to love you. But it's nothing new. Because here we have this woman 3,000 years ago saying, don't stare at me because I'm dark. Because society then said, if you're dark, you're ugly. You're poor. But if you're fair, you're beautiful. And, and she's struggling with this, and she knows it's, it's not right. But she's fighting a losing battle. She says, dark am I? Yeah, lovely. 
O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, dark like the tent curtains of Solomon. Don't stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. Dark because well, she doesn't seem to have a dad who stands up for her against her abusive brothers. Because it seems that her abusive brothers have forced her to work in their vineyards and so she hasn't even had time to work in her own. And when I read that, I was thinking of Amani. She hasn't got a dad who stands up for her and then she's abused by her brothers. So here, here is this woman and she, she understands why people love the husband, the bridegroom, he's, he's the king, Solomon. She, she knows that, that she's lovely, but there's the whole of society, even her family, are against her. And so she feels terrible. But she knows she loves the Lord. She says, verse 7, tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. She's seeking the one who loves her the way she is. Dark. Where can I find the one who loves me and who I love because he loves me? Tell me. You whom I love, where you graze your flock, where you rest your sheep at midday, because the king is also a shepherd, the good shepherd, who lays down his life for his sheep, who loves his sheep more than he loves his own life. Where, where, where can I find a shepherd? Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? The idea of, uh, of, of having to veil herself because... She doesn't want anyone to look at her the way she is. Anyone to see her the way she is because they think she's ugly. Well, where can you find this? Well, look at what the friends say. If you do not know, know where he is, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. Now, it's poetry, but the poetry is, right, well, it's, it's the shepherd who loves you. It's the good shepherd who loves you. Go and, go and put your goats by his sheep, because the shepherd is always with his sheep. So, go, go. Where, where are you going to hear and experience the love of Christ. You have to go where the other sheep are. Now there are times when individually, personal worship, reading the Bible, you can be overwhelmed uh, by the love uh, of Christ, but I guarantee it's happened way more in meetings where God's people have been together than it's ever happened with you individually. And, and, and here's the, the church corporate, the friends of the bride. If you don't know where he is, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherd. Go, go and be amongst God's people. Go and be where the other sheep are. And that's where you will find the shepherd because the shepherd knows his sheep by name. The shepherd loves his sheep. The shepherd dwells with his sheep. Listen to Jesus' words. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. He said, go and, go and be with the other sheep. Have Christ as your shepherd and you will know him holding you in his vice-like loving grip. His love will never let you go. Your shepherd knows you. He knows all about you. He knows your name. He knows your needs. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. He knows you warts and all. And he's chosen to be your shepherd. And he's chosen you to be one of his sheep. You don't need to pretend that you're better than you are. You don't need to put a, a false persona on. You can't hide anything from him anyway. And as we, we read at communion, who did he come from? Who did he die for? Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. We could say the beautiful, the morally beautiful for the morally ugly. The one who is light died for those who are full of darkness. Listen to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Where do you want to find a love that is everlasting? A love that loves you for who you really are. Warts and all, will you have to return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls who knows you inside out and yet has chosen to love you and let down his life for you okay yeah but i know i'm not beautiful on the inside i know i'm not nice on the inside i know on the inside i'm i'm ugly i'm full of darkness i'm full of sin I don't even like myself half the time. So how can God love me? How can God find me beautiful? Well, listen. So here's, here's the bridegroom speaking, the lover. I liken you, my darling, to a mare. Harnessed to one of... Pharaoh's chariots. I bet that's not a phrase you've ever used for, for Helen, is it? Is it? No, it's not, not, recently. not recently, no. No. Why no one? Well, probably there's only two people in this room that um, would, would perhaps understand it. There's someone here who studies form. Jason. Do you, uh, have you ever been to the ring where, where the horses are paraded with their jockeys on them before they go to the starters no. and the starters? No. no? I've never been to a... You've never been to the race? But do you watch it on the telly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were watching a film last night and a uh, uh, girl never been horse racing in her life, didn't have a clue, and she said, well, my dad's best friend said, I should put all my money on this horse. And she's, she's, she's caring for this rich banker who's now paraplegic but he's like done it all before and he says you've never been racing have you she goes no and uh, so they go to the races and uh, they're, they're at the, the enclosure and all the horses are going around all these beautiful thoroughbred horses and uh, she goes oh that's the one he's going to win and he goes not a chance his coat is dull that means he's in poor condition his ears are backwards that means he's really unsettled and on edge 
and I look at his backside, her backside, because she was a filly, look at her backside, and uh, she's not as muscled up as she should be. And uh, starter's orders, all the other horses come bolting out of the race, out, out of the starter's gates, and then about three seconds later, this horse comes walking out. And he goes, I told you so. Well, this is the opposite of that. This is a, a thoroughbred mare who is at the absolute peak of condition and is such high quality and so expensive, she's, she's good enough to pull one of Pharaoh's chariots. She's an exquisite thing. So you've got to work it. This is poetry. But it's saying, this is beautiful. This is gorgeous. This is perfect form. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings. <laughs> right, you've got to think about it. Yeah. Right, it's not talking about studs. Okay? Now, okay. how many of you have had an earring with a chain that goes from your ear to your nose? No. But in India... And in Asia, that's what they do at their weddings. And the idea is, you, it's all to gain your attention. Now, I'm going to do a test on you, Howard. I'm going to see how, how good you Poor are. Poor Howard. Poor Howard. See, well, he sat next to his wife, okay? I, I might have used, I might have used uh, Stephen if Catherine was there, but she's not there. And you're not wearing a necklace, so it doesn't work. So I've got to use you. Process of elimination, okay? So Helen is wearing a beautiful necklace. Yes? Howard, why is Helen wearing the necklace? Oh. Ah. I guess to look uh, like Wayne. No, no, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Look, why is she wearing that necklace? <laughs> Enhance her appearance. So you say she's ugly without necklace. Oh, 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 oh. 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 oh yeah, uh, see, that's what I said. It's just, Okay. <laughs> what? Why? Why? What's jewelry designed for? Is it to make the woman more beautiful, or is is it to get dimwits like us attention? Because we 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 you know our eyes are drawn to sparkly things. What's more sparkly, the necklace or Helen's eyes? I'm letting you off the hook. Oh, yeah. I'm letting you off the hook. <laughs> okay. The necklace is there to draw your attention. But you, you know, if, if I stood looking at Helen's necklace, she might punch me. Because <laughs> it's, you know, but you don't stay looking at the necklace. You have to, you, you're drawn to the face because the face has a smile on it and there's those sparkly eyes. And, and a necklace doesn't love you or say I love you, but the face does. And he, here is this picture. that She's, she's, she's like a, like a filly that's that's top of a form and the best one in the whole kingdom, worthy of pulling Pharaoh's chariot. She's her, her cheeks are beautiful with earrings, her neck with strings of jewels. Verse eleven: We will make you earrings of gold, studded with silver. Who's making the jewellery? The, the lover. Who is adorning and beautifying the bride? The lover. And this is a this is a biblical picture. You see you don't get your beauty from you. You don't get your beauty from your parents and the mix of genes that they're in. Where does your beauty come from? Where does the everlasting beauty that is beautiful in God's eyes, where does it come from? Well, listen to Ezekiel chapter 16. This is, this is the Lord. Uh, and again, it's using poetry describing the Lord's relationship with the whole of Israel, 
with his people, with his Old Testament church. And it says, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, verse 3, Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. This is looking at Abraham and Sarah. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloth. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood, and as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew. You who were naked and bare. Later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewellery. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was fine flour, honey and olive oil. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now that's in a poetry, in, a, in this picture of, of the whole of God's dealing with Israel, with the Old Testament church. But then you go on and he says, but God says, but you played the prostitute and you went after other husbands after I had done all this for you. So where does your beauty come from? Who makes your beauty perfect? Who adorns you so that you sparkle like jewellery in God's eye. Jesus. He is the one who gives you his beauty. He's the one who is altogether lovely. And here's the wonder of it. The day you ask Jesus to forgive you and to be your saviour, he gives you his beauty. So where does your identity come from? Um, when, uh, when we first went to Bible college, um, Alan Reese is a pastor in uh, Town Hill. He's retired now. And uh, he used to be outside half for my, uh, my stake. Uh, he played in Welsh Cup final for my stake, outside half. And uh, do you know, every time he used to see me, for years afterwards, he'd go, Mosley! He couldn't remember my name, but he remembered that I played rugby for Mosley. Because even as a Bible college student, even as a, as a young Christian, I got way more of my identity from having been a not bad rugby player than I did from following Christ. We all do it, don't we? You know, what sort of image do we want to portray in the pub? or amongst my work colleagues, what do I want them to think about me? I'm one of the boys. I'm sporty. I'm clever. Oh, you'll always want me in your pub quiz. Or your Christmas quiz in the mission. Oh, she, 
she's always smart. What, what, what persona do we rely on? What, what image gives us a sense of self-worth and value? Do you know what? If the answer is anything other than Jesus, you're settling for second best. And I'm settling for second best. There is nothing that compares to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is an unfading beauty. It doesn't mean, ladies, that you know you haven't got to bother with your hair and your makeup. And it doesn't doesn't mean that you've got to dress like some cults. You know, you've all got to wear crimpoline skirts and have a scarf <laughs> over your head and not wear makeup. It's not saying that. It's not saying that you know. Don't make any effort at all, because actually the Bible doesn't teach that at all. But it's saying, no, don't get your sense of value and identity from outward beauty. Because it's fading, isn't it? It's fading. And, and, and very often that, that sense of outward beauty is, is always being directed and, and moved upon by what society says is beautiful. So you're always having to change your fashion, whatever, the way you look, the length you have your hair, whether you have your luscious lashes, <laughs> your XXXXXXL luscious lashes, or whatever. It's always having to change, isn't it? Yeah. But God's beauty is unchanging and is unfading. He gives us his beauty. And then, we're back, you know, still in poetry. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. Well, it's poetry. What she's saying, these are two very heady scents. But who gives her this beautiful perfume? Where's it from? Her lover, the Lord. She's saying, you know, my even my fragrance, not, not just my beauty, but my beautiful fragrance comes from my lover. That's why God's word says in the New Testament, we are to spread the fragrance of Christ. Wherever we are, we are to God, the fragrance of Christ, and to those who are being saved, we are the fragrance of life. But to those who are perishing, with the smell of death. Where does a fragrance come from? Where does your fragrance come from? Jesus. Yeah. Kim's favourite cake is lemon drizzle cake. And uh, um, you don't just squeeze the lemon juice out because actually that doesn't give much, much good taste at all. All you do is you, you get your zester and you... Scrape the zester along the skin because the lemon oil is way stronger flavour and scent than lemon juice. And when you scrape it across, oh, suddenly this beautiful fragrance. The idea of when it's squeezed, when it's bruised, when it's crushed, that's when the most beautiful fragrance comes out. Well, when was Christ squeezed? When was Christ crushed? What is the most beautiful thing about Jesus to you? Is that when he went to the cross for you, for all your sin, it's the most beautiful thing. And as Christians then, when we're crushed, when we're squeezed, when we're pressed, we shouldn't behave the way the world does and bite back and retaliate. We should be like we should be like Christ. We should let even more of the fragrance of Christ comes out. She says, "My fragrance comes from my lover." And here are his words. Then 
And I want you to realize this is Jesus talking to you if you're one of his. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are like doves. Forget the doves bit. Jesus says to you, you are absolutely beautiful to him. You are exquisite to him. He loves you and you are his darling. It's not just a word. Her response, our response, how handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. And your bed is verdant. But you know, even though the Lord has said it to her twice, you are beautiful, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. How does she respond? This is where, I'm sorry, I'm about to destroy some of your favourite hymns. You're the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Do you know that one? Who's the lily of the valley? Chapter 2, verse 1. It ain't Jesus. The lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, is the church. Not Christ. Because it's all in the feminine singular. Not masculine singular. Okay, so when people did that, wrote those hymns, they got the Bible, their interpretation of the Bible wrong. She says, I'm a rose of Sharon, or, or a crocus, it can be translated. I'm a crocus of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. What's she saying? Well, when the rains come in Israel... The desert blooms with millions and millions of crocuses. What's she saying? I'm really common. I'm not beautiful. I'm common. I, I'm, I'm a lily of the valleys. Again, when the rains come, the, the lilies are, are everywhere. He's saying, you are so special. You are amazing. You, you are my beloved. And she goes, no, I'm not. I am really ordinary. You might be feeling that tonight. Yeah, you're hearing all about Christ's overwhelming love for you. And you just don't get it. You just don't feel it. Well, that's just how she was. Now, I, 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 I can't understand why Jesus would love me. I, I'm so ordinary. I'm so common. There is nothing special about me. And so you have to listen to what Christ says. Like a lily or a crocus among thorns is my darling among the maidens. She says she's just a crocus amongst millions of crocuses. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're like one crocus amongst millions of thorns. He's saying, I only have eyes for you. In my eyes, you are exquisite. You are unique. And I only have eyes for you. Because you're nice. Because you're worthy. Because you're good. No. I, I said to someone this morning, how are you? They dissolved into floods of tears. And they said, after that sermon, I, I, I don't know why Jesus would love me. And I said, that's what happens when God's spirit speaks to you and you realize he loves you, but you feel so unworthy. And you can't explain why he should love you. I said, the danger is when you think he should love you. 
and you think you deserve his love. I said, that's when you were about as far away from his love as you could be. But when you know what you're like, and up against Christ, you see your unworthiness and your dirtiness and your ugliness, and you just feel you're so ordinary, you can't understand why he would love you. But here's the wonder of the gospel. He's chosen to love you. And you don't feel beautiful, and sometimes you don't speak beautiful, and you don't act beautiful. But here's the wonder of it. He gives his beauty to you and to me. What The idea of justifications, his righteousness, given to us the moment we believe. And then, that's once and for all, and then as a believer then, there's the process of sanctification of he. He starts to make you more and more lovely and more and more beautiful in your thoughts and in your words and in your actions. But that is a whole process of the Holy Spirit working in your heart that takes a whole lifetime and is only perfected the moment you die and you're taken up into glory. But all your beauty and my beauty comes from him. And does he make mistakes? Is he going to make you ugly? No. And the Bible says, and when we see him, we shall be like him. Then the full process of beautification is over. But here's a wonder. He's loved you before he ever started to work in you. The Bible says he's loved you from everlasting to everlasting. You see it, don't you? you know, there'll be a, this beautiful, exquisite old building, but it's gone to ruin. And then the builders move in, and the scaffolding <laughs> goes up, and they, they put all the, uh, the green or, or blue plastic meshing all around to protect people from uh, underneath from stuff falling off. And, uh, and you can hear the drills going and the jackhammers and the, the water pressure blasters and everything else. And, and, and you know they're doing some work there, but you can't see what they're doing. When do you see what they're doing? When do you see it? Only when they're finished. And they take all that safety wrapping off and the scaffolding comes down. And then you see... Whoa, I didn't even realise that was there before because it was covered by all the dirt and the grime and, and all the neglect and everything else. Well, you know, that's the work that Jesus is doing on you and me now. The scaffolding's up. The wrapping's all around. And he's working on us. He's given us his beauty, but he doesn't want to just give us his beauty. He wants to make us beautiful. He wants to make us fit for his beautiful heaven. And the wrapping's only going to come off by the day Jesus comes back to take us to be with himself or the day we die. And then our beauty will shine like the midday sun for all eternity because it will be his beauty. But this is how he thinks of you now. Not just in the future. How Beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. You are like a lily amongst all the thorns. That might not how you think about yourself. But you know what? It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. The most important thing is what Christ thinks about you. It's about how Christ sees you. Isn't that amazing? You can understand why we would love him, but that he would love us like this, truly, madly, deeply. But he does. He says, oh, you are my darling. Oh, how beautiful you are. Lord, we can understand why uh, you are loved because you are altogether lovely uh, you are perfect and pure and loving and sacrificial uh, you're the altogether lovely one and Lord we feel our own sin and 
unworthiness and uh, ugliness on the outside and ugliness on the inside. And look, but Lord, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you say that we are your beloved, that we are lovely in your eyes, that we are your darling. And you are the one who has given us your beauty. Uh, we were made in the image of God, but that image was flawed and fallen and defaced. Uh, and you have uh, given it back to us. Uh, Lord, we just praise you and thank you. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we're forgiven. We thank you that you've given us your righteousness, your moral perfection and beauty. That's a, a legal declaration in heaven. But we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are working in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. Lord, not just to make us trust you, uh, not just to make us praise you, but you are changing us from glory into glory. The scaffolding's still up and all the wrapping's still on, but we thank you that there's a day coming when your work will be completed and all the scaffolding and the wrapping will come off your whole church the new Jerusalem, and we will be like a bride beautifully adorned for her husband. And the dwelling place will be with man for all time. And there'll be no more tears, no more shame, no more pain, no more death, for everything will be made new. And then we will be beautiful inside and out. For all eternity. Amen.